horses in life It's all the same to me The reason that my heart keeps Beating inside Horses in life So I'll start I'm from Black Diamond And I'm a Molly student And she's just helped me a ton Over these few years that I've known her And I've had horses my whole life And trail ridden all over everywhere forever and I started a young horse it'll be two years ago now a black forest draft horse I'm middle-aged can't believe I'm saying that but I don't feel middle-aged but I'm staring down 55 here pretty soon I still feel you know like I'm 40 so but I, I don't know what happens to us when we get older but um, related to confidence, but I took my young guy out today on the trail, and I was just a nervous wreck, and I, and I'm, I'm like, what? Where does that come from? I mean, I'm very safe. He's not dangerous. He's very predictable. I just, if I take him to a new environment, I get like that, and on the way back, I was totally fine, and, but on the way out there, I was just, like, lathered up. It was terrible, and really? natural nature to be that way, so... You say, are you saying that you feel that's natural for you or it's not? It's not. It is not. Wow. It's not that way. And I've trail ridden all my, my whole life. And my husband was with me on my totally steady trail horse. And everything went great. And But that just comes up in me. And I'm like, does anyone else experience that ever? Or just me. Well, is there anybody else on the call who's willing to unmute and talk about that? I mean, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna get into the real meat of what you can do about it when we get Molly on, but I think it's good. This is actually very good. We can people share some of their stories. Well, for example, my wife experienced it because she'd been thrown off of horses a couple of times and a couple of times it hurt pretty bad. Uh, and then Astro, her current horse, but when we got him, he was a vertical bucker. He's our second Palomino quarter horse. That's Astro right there. That's the guy, the Palomino <laughs> there. He now weighs about 1,300 pounds, is uh, 16 even, but he had this really love for bucking. And then he started to figure out that if he bucked or just threatened to buck, he could get Renee to stop asking him to do things because he's a left brain introvert, lazy as the day is long. Astro used to be going for most bucking horse on the planet, and now he has earned a finals spot in laziest horse on the planet. And so his laziness, he would use it against Renee and say, well, I'll threaten to buck. And because Renee had been bucked off, it was, he was getting it over on her. And fortunately, you know, going all the way to the end, Renee just won her fourth state championship in trail trials on that horse. And the horse is now blind. Mm. That's Renee's story. Hasn't been as much of an issue for me, but I know it's very real because it's very real for my wife. It's very real. This is Michelle C here, and um, that's exactly what I'm coming off of. And um, I'm kind of restarting my my nine year old young horse. And um, yeah, so apparently Renee and I have something to talk about. Yeah, and he's a Palomino. Oh, he's also a Palomino. Yeah, who likes to. Is he a buck or two? Is he fun? For, he does it for fun. Well, I didn't think he was, but apparently he is. And oh, wow! And I've become unseated, and I'm coming off of a rib injury from the summer. It's been my confidence is totally shaken. Well, you're not alone here, Michelle. Definitely, definitely not alone. This is Margaret from Bakersfield. Oh, hey, Margaret. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Margaret, we were just starting to talk about some confidence issues because obviously a lot of people are here tonight to see. Do you have any confidence issues you want to talk about tonight? I always have confidence issues. I wouldn't know where to start about my confidence issues. I have my new horse and he's working out quite nicely. But I can see that he has confidence issues. Is your new horse more confident than your previous horse? Depends. On what we're doing. Mm -hmm. He's not, not very confident on the obstacles. It's a gilding. He's 22. Nice. He's pretty short. Oh, that's good. So you don't have to use scaffolding to get up on him like uh, your last horse, right? Well, not like Reba. And that's 
about all. No, no Pirelli, so we're starting over. I'm starting over again. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that this horse came without any natural horsemanship background. Because you said he had no Pirelli. That's why I was wondering if you were just getting him to do basic things. As I say, as I've always heard, that, you know, the higher levels are just level one with excellence and precision. And so, anyway, we had a lesson with uh, Jody Grimm Ellis, and he did very well. But you can see his traditional training coming out, so it's just going to take a while. Molly Sanders graduated from the university closest to the northwest corner of the lower 48 states. It's Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington in 1996 with a BA in education. And two years later, she completed her master's in education focused on curriculum and instruction. She taught a variety of programs with a wide range of ages over the next 12 years. And she loved the challenges that teaching presented but in 2005, like a lot of us, when we finally get to see Pirelli for the first time, it was a demonstration in Washington. That was a Pirelli tour stop. You experienced the wow, and then for a lot of us, we got to go after the how. And indeed, that was the case with our special guest tonight. Four years later, and two months into her externship at the Pirelli Center campus in Ocala, Florida, when she quit her teaching job to dedicate full time to the pursuit of excellence in horsemanship and to become a Pirelli professional. In the years since that summer, along with her husband and IT computer guru, Brett, Molly worked in nearly every area of the Pirelli organization directly with Pat and Linda, teaching courses on the ranch, filming DVDs on the Pirelli media team, she applied her strong background in education to developing the e-learning program on Pirelli Connect. But along the way, Molly kept her own horsemanship learning journey at the forefront. Brett and Molly have since returned home to Washington State, where Molly serves the region as a three-star Pirelli professional. She's an enthusiastic promoter of the Pirelli Savvy Club. She's got a website, nwsavvy.com. She provides both live instruction and online uh, coaching. Like most of us on this teleconference, Molly has experienced the loss of confidence moment and that period that follows when you have to find your way to get your confidence back. Uh, Molly's lectured on the subject of confidence for many groups and our Barry Savvy Players Learning Teleconference is pleased to have Molly Sanders as our special guest tonight. Molly's about to put both her teaching principles and her natural horsemanship principles to purpose in helping us learn more about the art of confidence. So let's welcome Molly Sanders. Yay. Thank you. Yay, I could, oh, look, they're all saying yay on the... Uh, on the yay. Yeah, so thank you, Andrew. Yeah, uh, so I am really excited to be here tonight, and it's definitely a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I have a lot of experience with it, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But I just wanted to have, you know, give a shout out to Nancy and Michelle and Margaret and Christina for being brave enough to share a little bit of your story. And I think what I'm going to share tonight, my goal is that all of you leave with something that you can use definitely you're not alone. I want to start with telling you a little bit about my about my story. So I was a horse crazy kid. I always felt probably an uh, unearned confidence around horses and up until you know I became an instructor there there were times that I got a little shaken but every time I'd get thrown it never it never rattled me enough that I was scared to get back on. Until a few years ago, I was starting, attempting to start my young thoroughbred, and I won't give you all the details, but I had an attempted first ride with the saddle, and things went awry. And it wasn't a big, it wasn't a big wreck, but it was big enough that I blew out my ACL and had to go through surgery and, and yeah, and six months of rehab. And so I, ha I can now say I have experienced having my confidence completely shattered and I can relate to a lot of the things that were, have already been said tonight. 
And, and even if you haven't gotten to the place where it's been shattered, I know that some of the things I'm going to share with you can help. So I had to start from ground, I don't know, minus three <laughs> and get myself back to where I'm a thinking, functioning, skillful horsewoman. Luckily, my confidence, it was really just with my young thoroughbred. I, other horses, I was okay. I still was riding. and But with this horse, it, it rocked my world. And some of you that are tuning in tonight have heard this story, but I just wanted to share that with those of you that hadn't heard it. I, one of the things that I learned, so I, I want to I say all of the things I'm going to share with you tonight are, they're things that I've learned. So they're my interpretations. I'm not sharing these as fact. I'm sharing these as my experience. And one of the things that I learned early on is that fear is a very useful thing. And I think often it gets a bad rap and that fear has a job in our lives and it's, it's to keep us alive. And for me, being able to tell the difference between when it was fear and when it was just, not just, but when it was more anxiety. And the way I, t the way I define those for myself is that fear is when there's something really in actuality happening right in front of you and it's causing you to get scared. It's incredibly important that we listen to that. And that I think, um, like Lindo talks about that, you know, that's your gut telling you things. So, you know, it's really important that, that we listen to that. But then when things happen to us, like Nancy, you were sharing about Bentley, your youngster and your trail ride today, that might be what you were experiencing might have been fear. It may have been that Bentley was a little lit up and you're kind of like, Oh, I'm not sure what to expect here. Um, so it could be that you weren't inventing anything. It was actually what was in front of you. But what can end up happening is more where we get more anxiety, where it isn't, it's not, there's nothing in front of us that's happening at the time that is threatening our life. It's the what ifs. It's our brain going, well, what if that happens again? Well, you know, this could happen or the unknown. So uh, Margaret and Christina, you guys both mentioned that you've got new horses. It's the unknown a lot of times. So it's not something that's actually in front of us. So I'm going to, I'm going to go into strategies that you can use to help tell the difference and, and strategies that you can use when you're experiencing anxiety, where it's things that you're, you're imagining, and then strategies you can use when it's actually things that are happening right, you know, right in front of you. I have a little slideshow that I'm going to hopefully cause to happen. That's because of Brett, the wonder, the wonder computer guy, my husband, he, he's right in the other room, just in case I end up showing random videos of like Diana Ross singing the national anthem. He can <laughs> run in and save me. Here we go. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to share tonight and thinking about all of the things that I've learned about rebuilding confidence, I started to think about the seven keys to success because I think about that a lot. And often I organize the education that I provide. I, I look at those seven keys when I'm uh, organizing what I'm going to present. And I realized that the things that I ended up doing to rebuild my confidence, and I'm really excited to share with you that I feel like it's rebuilt. The horse that I was sharing with you, I just had the best ride of my life on him. Well, the best ride of our lives, my life with him today. So I feel like I um, have rebuilt to where I was before the accident. Are you at a 10? Or Oh, no. No, not a 10, because I know too much now to be at a 10. Oh, okay. Uh, but I, I'd say, you know, I'm at a, I'm at a seven. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm back to where I was before, before I, before I got hurt. I never, I've never been a 10. I, I always, I always have certain things that I go, uh, I'm not riding that. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be doing that. So I'm, I'm fairly cautious and more as I get older. So, and my mom's watching this too. So I can't, I can't share well, too many we don't bounce hair raising stories. Either. We don't bounce anymore. Yeah, right. So what I wanted to share with you, I, I'm just going to run through the seven keys to success and basically how I use those to help me. And what I realized as I was going through this is this could be a really cool thing for all of you guys to do as an exercise. 
you know, maybe after we're done, or if I get really boring, you can do it while I'm talking. But to go through those seven keys and think about, do I have this in my life right now? Which one of these do I need to get more help with? So let me run through them. So the first one is attitude. And as we know with horses, our attitude is, you know, 98% of the, the deal. And so I really had to do a lot of work to keep my attitude positive because it's really easy to get down on ourselves when we're feeling unconfident. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. It was, that was a big one. So as you're looking at these, you might look at that and go, okay, how is my attitude? How is my attitude about my confidence? And if it's in the toilet, that would be a big, big piece to really work on. And again, I'm going to share with you some strategies for that. share the quote that fear and frustration start where knowledge ends. And it's really true. I, I'm not a cult starter. I have started a handful um, with other people helping me. I have a lot of respect for people that, that do that. So I needed more knowledge. What ended up happening rocked my world because I didn't really know why it happened. I knew, but I needed more, I needed more information. So I was kind of relentless about seeking that out. So you might, as you're looking at, at this, you might ask yourself, you know, is it knowledge? Is there a piece of information that I'm missing? Tools, I didn't really have, this one didn't really come up for me in my journey, but it could be for you. It could be that the tool you're using is, is new and is causing your unconfidence. So your, your knowledge about the tool needs to increase or you might need to get a different tool. Techniques, huge. So for, and this is specific to rebuilding confidence. There are actually techniques that help. And I'm going to share quite a few of them with you that I used. And I'm hoping that at least one will ring true for you. Time. So the other thing I thought was interesting as I was going through this is I think as we're rebuilding or building or helping somebody else rebuild their confidence, we need to treat ourselves or that other person the way we would treat an unconfident horse. And you hear all the time that it has to be on the horse's timeline. Well, you're rebuilding your confidence. It has to be on your timeline. If somebody else is saying, you're ready, you can do this, and you're so upset and nervous that your brain can't even function, you better darn sure have a ton of trust in that person, like a ton of trust. Or say, hey, I'm just not ready. I, and it, it has to be your timeline. The other piece of the time part is you, you, you have to put the time in. There were, there were quite a few days where I wanted, to, I wanted to quit. I didn't ever want to quit that Bobby, my thoroughbred. I, I didn't ever get to the point where I wanted to find a different home for him. But if, if things had kept going downhill, I would have gotten there. There were times that I, it wasn't fun. It was hard. It was, it was awkward and I didn't want to do it. And I, I had to adjust my attitude. Nobody else can put that time in for you. It has to be you. Imagination. So this is a big one. And I'm going to talk about this in a little bit in my techniques section. We can use our imagination when we get unconfident our imagination can work against us because we can keep replaying the event or all of the what ifs, maybe something that hasn't even happened, but all of the what ifs. So our imagination is so powerful and it can really work against us. So, but the cool thing is, is we can set it up where it's working for us and we are, we're imagining what we want to have happen. We're putting into practice the knowledge that we've, we've learned. And again, I'm going to share a little bit more about specifics on that in a minute and support. I, there's no way I could have gone, gone through this and be, been successful if I hadn't had support. I reached out to people. Amy and Nate Bowers were huge. They helped me with the first rides after I botched mine. And, uh, and then after I got home with him, after I had started, I took over on ride four and I put six rides, got home, I was on ride, oh, I don't know, 20, and he did a, a large energetic rearing spree three times in a row and 
knocked my confidence right back down to zero. And luckily, as fate would have it, Cezanne de Cristoforo had just moved to Oregon. Many of you know her and were probably sad to see her move. And I know she keeps coming back to California. But anyway, it was it was huge for me. Um, I called her and told her what had happened. And her first response was, I love rearing. And so I was like, you are the person for me. And she has been, she's just been crucial for me as a support person. So finding that support is huge. So again, I would encourage you guys to go through these seven keys in whatever you're experiencing. I mean, this could be for business, horses, anything uh, that you want to build your confidence in. Going through these and looking at, hmm, which one of these do I need? Or you might, it's probably more than one do I need support with or help with. You just said something to me that resonated in a way I've never had and I've been looking at the seven keys to success for probably the better part of two decades. Uh -huh. But when you described imagination, what I also heard you say was something that I call visualization. Yeah. In the sense that you look at something and you say, what is the, what is the reality that I want? Right. And so I never thought about imagination as maybe I could get my confidence back. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the, it's the piece where Lin Linda talks a lot about asking people, what's your dream? Like, what keeps you doing this? That's imagination that gets you to that place. I had not put that so. under imagination, but that's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. And then the other one I wanted to hit was support. That's one of the reasons why we really work hard to keep very savvy players going. That's why there's the probably the savvy club tying yourself in with other people and now right. you have other organizations beyond Prelly that are helping with support. So there's a lot of relationship-based and natural support out there. It's one of the reasons why we have this conference. So support is really huge. It's, it's huge for sure. And of course, yeah. we love Cezanne. Thank you for bringing her up. Oh, absolutely. So I have several techniques I'm going to go into more detail with. And by the way, if, because I know that you guys are all muted, you know, if you have any questions, like Andrew said, you can uh, type them into the chat window or jot them down because we are going to have time for questions after I get done yammering. So, so the techniques part was critical for me. And so the things I'm going to share are listed here retreat and approach, otherwise known as approach and retreat, zones of learning and the 80 20 rule self-compassion, visualization, and mindfulness. So I'm going to go into each one in a more detail. I love this picture. So retreat and approach. Pat's been calling it this now for a little while. And the reason being that retreat really is where confidence is built. You can't have one without the other. Like you need approach as well to build confidence, but it's the retreat that's key. And as humans, as a predatory species, approach is way more natural for us. And the retreat, not so much. And I think that's part of why in our culture, our culture is a very much approach-centric culture. You get after it. You, you know, get, on, get back on. I mean, the horse culture, but even beyond that, I'm sure we could all come up with all sorts of of phrases that kind of have that mentality and then retreat gets a bad rap you're right. you're weak you're you're this you're that you're giving up retreat is critical one of the things that I had to do at first actually I'll tell you just a quick story after I had my surgery and I was in a brace I I that's where I really started learning about the role of fear so I, at the time, I had my herd in a pasture together and at our, our house, and I, I would approach the fence, and I'm hobbling. I think, I think I was on crutches still, so I'm, you know, going along, and I'd approach the fence, and a very loud feeling came up in me of, don't go in there. And I, instead of, I, I, instead of getting upset that, oh my gosh, you're so, you know, you're, you're too afraid to go in there with your horses... I knew exactly what was going on because if I had gone in there and one of my horses had rubbed on me or whatever, and I had taken a stumble, boom, 
all, I'd have to start all over again. I would have had to have surgery again. So when, um, Nancy, you were sharing a little bit about like, as we get older, why is it that all of a sudden we've got that, that fear that comes up? I really do think our brains know that our bodies are more vulnerable. And, and so we have to do more work to be able to convince our brains that we aren't crazy. We do have the skill level. That was one of the things that I had to really honor. So I, I hung out on the outside of the fence for, I don't know, a couple weeks until I, I didn't have that feeling anymore. And I knew that if I went in there, I'd be okay. Retreat was huge for me in the very beginning. Then fast forward a few years and I'm even at one point, even thinking about riding um, Bobby, my thoroughbred would bring up anxiety. Like I, you know, my heart would start racing. So I did a lot of things like my approach would be where I was in the arena with him. And my approach was just going, Hmm, if all goes well, I'll get on. That was the approach. I wasn't even moving toward him to get on. I it just, in my mind, it was the approach. And then I'd pay attention to what happened to my chemicals and I would wait until my RPMs came down to the point where I could think and I was breathing and I could observe him. And then I would go and get a little closer. And so I did things like I'd, I'd hang out on the mounting block. I'd stand on the mounting block with him and hang out there and observe him. And if I started to get that feeling would come up, I would, I'd take, I'd, I'd let myself off the hook. So it's, it's similar to how we, we approach our horses, how we treat our horses. We might ask our horse to do something and their adrenaline comes up and their fear, their fear response comes up. Then we retreat until they calm back down, but then we're going to approach again or we're never going to get anywhere. So I think giving yourself permission to take that time and pay attention to what's going on inside you. And one of the things that I knew that I was okay to approach more was when my brain worked. <laughs> I mean, I would get to where my adrenaline would come up and my cortisol and all those chemicals would come up to the point where I couldn't think. All I could do was feel this feeling. I was in no position to get on at that point. So if somebody had told me at that point, go ahead and get on, I, I, it wouldn't have been a good idea. Except I will make an exception for that. When I started, when Cezanne started coaching me, I trusted her really with my life. And I, I watched her, she'd ride first. And I, I communicated with her. I told her, Cezanne, my brain isn't working. So I'm going to need you to talk me through every step because I, all of the skills that I built all these years were not available to me. We had a good team thing going, but I also would, you know, sometimes she'd say, you can do it, you can do it. And I knew, I, I knew I, I could on one level, but at that point I had too much going on. I had to stop and get off. So you got to give yourself permission to be in control of that. Nobody else can, can tell you what you need to do when you need to do it. You have to listen to that inside yourself. So now I'm to the point where I'm thinking all the time. I had a, a couple weeks ago, he bucked with me um, under saddle and I, I laughed and I knew I was like, yes, but six months, a year ago, that would have, that would have destroyed me. So anyway, takes, take, you got to take the time it takes. So onward. So with this one, uh, this is something that many of you have experienced with Stephanie Burns, for those of you that were around in the red and blue pack days. So she talked to us about uh, the zones of learning. And during that time that I was learning this from her, I was teaching fourth grade and it changed, it transformed how I taught my fourth graders, I taught them this concept and that learning can be really uncomfortable and that they need to protect, you know, they, that the comfort zone has a role and the shutdown zone, you know, they, they learned what they all felt like. I'll just tell you, it was, it was mind boggling for me too. The first time I heard that learning is hard. Yes, and, I know. And Isn't that crazy? Like, like you, I'd gone through graduate school and I finally heard that and I was like, 
it is hard. Yeah. And you have to kind of allow for that. And then you have to allow for the fact that when you're teaching somebody, including your horse. Right. That it is hard. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So getting to know your zones of learning as it relates to your confidence, I think is a really cool tool. So I'll kind of talk you through, through it a little bit. Looking at the comfort zone, what are the things that you can do with your horse right now that are just comfortable? You don't need to think about it. It feels good. You don't have any RPMs, any anxiety come up. It feels good. And like I shared with you, right after my surgery, the comfort zone, what would be in my comfort zone would be sitting on the other side of the fence, watching my horses. Wow. And I wouldn't have had really anything in either of those other zones. Wow. So it's okay wherever you are, it's okay. So I would, I would kind of be really honest with yourself and look at what are the things that I feel 100% confident with. I don't care who, what you felt two years ago or who, what your neighbor feels like because we all do the whole comparison thing and it's just, blah, it doesn't lead you anywhere. So really look at what are the things that feel good to me that I can do when I'm with my horse and write those down. And then look at the learning zone. What are the things that are awkward, that you're learning, that you do have to think about? Maybe they get your RPMs up a little bit, but you can still think. That's my, that's how I, tell the two apart. Your brain still works. You're still able to observe your horse, but you might get butterflies a little bit. That would be the things in your learning zone. So in this example, riding at a walk, being around other horses with this horse might be in somebody's learning zone. And then look at the shutdown zone. What are the things that cause you, even thinking about them, cause you to go, oh my gosh, there's no way. And for me, at one point, getting on Bobby was in my shutdown zone. Mounting my horse (laughs) was in that zone. And I'm an instructor. And I had to do a lot of work at keeping myself from tearing myself apart because that now was in my shutdown zone. And like I said, luckily my saving grace, or one of my saving graces was that I still felt confident with other horses. I was still able to ride my other horses confidently. So looking at those things in your shutdown zone, some of the things might be like, some of the things might be in your learning zone, but they're really close to your shutdown zone. Like maybe being around other horses might be really close to your shutdown zone, but you're still able to think about it. So you might even think about that. You can kind of monkey around with where you place them. So the reason that this, I feel like this was crucial for me is that, so Pat talks about the 80-20 rule that you want to have 80% consistency and then 20% variety. And I applied this to my rebuilding of my confidence. So I had 80% of the time spent with things in my comfort zone with, with Bobby. I'm not kidding. (laughs) I'm like 80% of the time. And then I had 20% of the time things in my learning zone. And what ended up, what ended up happening was like, let's say, well, mounting, I'll use that as an example. That was in my shutdown zone, but in my learning zone was standing at the mounting block until finally that, the, that what, what was in my shutdown zone mounting, I was still taking steps to get there, but I was able to stand there at the mounting block and go, I'm still thinking, I'm observing him. I'm thinking about getting on. He's giving me all green lights. I'm going to get on. So I got on and then I got right back off. And then I stood there at the mounting block until I could breathe again and think again and observe him again. And then I did it again and got right back off and I did it again. And some of you have heard the concept that Stephanie Burns has shared about move closer, stay longer. That's the, that's the concept, but it's what we do with our horses. You know, at first with the stick and string, we put the string over their back and we take it right back off. We put it over their back. We take it right back off. Pretty soon we put it over their back. We leave it there a little longer. We take it right back off. But we, we keep getting, longer and longer that we're asking them to be confident with it. So we can do the same thing with ourselves. So I think that also in our culture, you hear things like the comfort zone gets a bad rap. You hear things like all growth, only, only growth can only happen in your learning zone. 
or growth can only happen outside of your comfort zone. Well, there's truth to that, but growth can't happen without your comfort zone. You have to go back there to recharge. You have to go back there to retreat and, and reflect and do all those things. So I would put, if you're rebuilding your confidence, I would put a lot of value on that. And I think a lot of times we don't value that enough because it's not, it's not what we think we should be doing. Just to add, I read Move Closer, Stay Longer, and mm -hmm. I have not seen it placed like this. Now, when you were going through this, did you have this, this breakdown? And did you literally decide what was in your zone? I didn't write it down until later on, but I did, I did really, and, it, and this was from a conversation I had with Cezanne. I really, I leaned on her uh, quite a bit. I, I shared with her how upsetting it was to me that here I am an instructor and, and, and she'd share stories with me about things that she'd struggled with. So that's another piece. The support. Of, yeah, of, of support and be reaching there. out, yeah. right. Re reaching out and knowing you're not alone. But she said to me, do things with him that you know you can be a leader. And that's when it, boom, rung in my oh, head. Like, yes, he's on good I've, been, I've been spending all this time thinking about all the things that I can't do, or I shouldn't say can't, but that, that I'm not a good leader for him at that, at that time. I was focusing on all those things instead of, hey, I could do all these things with him where I can be a leader and I get, and I get closer to those places that um, like mounting um, that I feel uh, are in my shutdown zone. So it's, it's so important. So I didn't have it in the beginning. I didn't have it mapped out like this, but it took a little while. And then I started to write these things down. And the cool thing was for me that really gave me a sense of success is that things started changing. Like things that were in my learning zone started moving into my comfort zone. Things that were in my shutdown zone, I started to move over maybe on the edge of my learning zone and my shutdown zone. Now they're in my learning zone. Now they're in, you know, my comfort zone, trotting him, without touching the reins with a carrot stick on my shoulder. I don't even know if there is a category on here that I could have written that. Like it just. Oh, so far off the chart. Yeah. yeah. And the, I'm doing that now, cantering him. I haven't started jumping him yet. That's now the thing that's on my learning zone shutdowns. Right. We did have a comment here from Linda. Uh -huh. She said, I filled out the chart like the zones of learning in March of 2019. And looking uh -huh. at it right now, I see a few things from my shutdown zone that are now in my learning zone. Yay! That's very encouraging. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Linda actually came and did, if, if it's the Linda, I, I think it is, um, came um, to a uh, Linda. Yeah. yeah. Yay. Hi, hi, Linda. Uh, she came to a workshop that I did um, and presented this concept. And uh, so it's, it is really cool. And I love that, um, Linda, you shared that it's really encouraging you because that's, that's what happened to me. I was like, oh, you know, because sometimes it, you feel like you're not making any progress because it can be so slow. Um, but to see that, oh my gosh, it, I am making progress is really cool. So I would encourage you to really look at this and then also give yourself permission to hang out a lot in your comfort zone. It'll, it'll give you more confidence to spend that time in your learning zone. And then if you do go to your shutdown zone, you need to get to your comfort zone right away. Um, you need to get off out of that situation and you know, to your comfort zone as soon as you can. I do have a comment because yet another one of these um, mind boggling things that just hit me in the moment was when you were describing the importance of, of really staying in that comfort zone, the analogy I thought of is an earthquake. And if this moment that caused you to fall down or, or you know, that, or to whatever it was that caused your, your lack of confidence was mm -hmm. like an earthquake. The comfort zone to me now listening to you, and it just came to me in the moment is like the foundation. Mm -hmm. And literally if you don't have a foundation, you know, you don't bother rebuilding the house. You got to yeah. start back to the foundation. We all do talk about foundation a lot in mm -hmm. terms of our, you know, essentially that's what level one, two, and three have always been is a foundation. And then you build performance on top of it. But right. here, we're seeing where you could apply comfort zone as your foundation. And then you really can own the fact that you've got to spend a lot of time there. Absolutely. I like that. That's great. Um, you know, good. I, it just hit me right now. So good yeah. job. Thank you. Yeah, that's great.
I'll have to I'll have to redo this and call it the earthquake chart. <laughs> California appropriate. Yeah. Okay. So another one that was critical and really continues to be in other areas of my life is self compassion. And this is something similar to what Andrew was saying about the idea of when you first learn that learning is actually it can be uncomfortable. Um, how mind blowing that is and how freeing it is that you you all realize that you're not alone. Same thing with self-compassion for me. It was like the blinding flash of the obvious. It was, I can't believe I didn't know this. How can I be, I'm 48 now. Um, sometimes if mom's watching, she, sometimes she has to correct me with my age, but I'm this old. How, how could it have been this long that I haven't known about this concept? So I want to share a little bit about this with you. And by the way, I'm going to compile a list of links for you because this is a book um, by Kristen Neff and I'll put together a list of resources um, that were helpful for me and I'll share those with Andrew and um, he can email them uh, to everybody that is here. Yeah, so Kristen Neff has put together this wonderful book and uh, has a ton of different exercises in it. And one of the exercises, exercises that was really helpful for me was just, it's a three-part exercise. I'll lead you through these. So the first example is how we typically talk to ourselves. And this is, I've been talking to quite a few people about this since I've learned it. I have yet to find someone that doesn't go, oh yeah, I do that. So it's, it's, it's a human, uh, all of us have it in common. Most of us, I think. Typical self-talk if we're feeling crummy, so the first step is that we're not, we're not feeling good. So, you know, maybe we're disappointed or we're unconfident or whatever it is. So fill in the blank of whatever it is that you're feeling crummy. So the next step tends to be that we isolate ourselves, meaning that we start telling ourselves that I'm the only one that feels this way. I'm the only one in this whole clinic that's having trouble. I'm the only one that, that can't get it together fill in the blank. I think you guys know what I'm talking about. I would venture to say that if not everybody here has felt that, I'd be really surprised. I would too. I mean, I think in some time in your life, you felt that if not 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so we tend to think we're the only ones. Okay. And then the la the next step, this is a real healthy one. Uh, the negative self-talk uh, starts. So we start really just reaming ourselves saying horrible things, like, hor like things you'd never, ever, ever dream of saying to somebody else. So that's a kind of a typical pattern that many of us go through when we're experiencing hardship and definitely conf lack of confidence that can happen. For me, I would say things like, you know, I'm the only instructor that is, you know, going through this and in I won't even share with you some of the things that I'd say, but you know, I, I'd say some pretty horrible things. So discovering how to turn it around is really cool. And it's super simple. The self-compassionate version of this is number one, you still feel crummy. Sorry. So you still have the negative feeling, but that you're going to identify it. So I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling fearful. I'm feeling whatever it is. You give it a name. And then the second thing is instead of isolating yourself, you, you connect. And an example of that would be that you realize that this is a, the human experience. This is something that all of us go through. So everybody feels fear. Everybody feels sad. Everybody feels sometime in their life, everyone feels one of those negative things. So you can tell yourself that I'm, I'm like other people. You can reach out and talk to people, you know, cause you'll find that most people are going to share with you a similar story. So connecting in, instead of isolating. And then the third thing is to really take the time to think about if a friend came to you and said to you, hey, I'm feeling really fill in the blank, fearful. What would you say to them? And then take the time to say that to yourself. And I started to write things, I'd write it down. And it is amazing. It's instant. Like the change it makes in how you feel is instant. And, and then I'd love to say that do this four times and you'll never have the typical self-talk happen again, but 
most likely you will, but it's cool. The more you practice the self-compassionate version, the easier that starts to come because you know, you're building the networks in your brain and we build the typical self-talk ne networks to the point that it's automatic. It happens without us even thinking about it. We can do the same thing with the self-compassionate one, but it takes time and repetition. Hmm. Similar to horsemanship. Okay, last two. And then I'd love to hear from you guys or if anybody has any questions. So visualization, huge. Once I got the knowledge, especially with the rearing episode that I went through, I really didn't understand why that, it, for me, it happened, it came out of nowhere. But when I understood why that happened, and then I knew I had a couple of strategies that I could use if it happened again, I visualized it happening. And I visualized it happening where I took care of it and I, I was okay. And I versus what our brain automatically does to replay the event, replay the event, replay the event, and you get all the same emotions happening. And our, it's only doing that so you don't, uh, you're not stupid and you don't go out and do it again because your brain's trying to keep you alive. But if you can convince your brain, hey, I've got, I, I've got the knowledge, I've got the tools, I can do this. And then that being said, like, let's say I found out what it took to, to, to deal with the rearing and I went, no way, there's no way, I don't have the skill, I can't do that. Then I would have reached out and had someone else do that for me. But I knew I could do that. I knew I could handle it. It would still scare me, but I knew that I had the skills to, to deal with it. So I visualized it going really well. I visualized myself confident. I actually visualized myself with Cezanne's attitude of, I love rearing. Um, and I had, I had to do it over and over and over because my brain would take over and I'd get all scared again. So I had to visualize that over and over. And then the other piece with visualization that was really critical for me was, and this picture of this young woman riding along bareback and look at her face, like, ah, and that, you know, her arms out. Yeah. I, that is, that's not specifically my picture, but that feeling that she has, that's what I visualized with Bobby. So that's a beautiful feeling. You see, you can see her passion. Absolutely. And, and, her, and that the, the horse's ears is up. The horse is happy too. Everybody. It's a hundred percent trust. Yes. It's, it's so much trust that she's experiencing joy in, in what she's doing there. And visualization, it's, it's so powerful and there's so much information on it these days. I would definitely spend time on that because you can build your skills even visualizing. There's that one. And then the last one that was key for me was mindfulness. Because it's easy when you are experiencing, especially anxiety, where you're, you're, you're thinking of the what ifs, you're thinking what could happen. Oh, what if a, a deer comes out of the bushes? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? You're no longer mindful of what's going on. The other, you're thinking, you're mindful of what isn't, right? So I had to really practice. Busy thinking about things that are not going. Right. So you're happening. Yeah. So you're mindful of all the things that aren't there that aren't happening. So you don't have any space in your brain to be aware of what is happening. Yeah. You're not in the moment. Right. You know, observing your horse can really help you as well because they are very in the moment. What can happen is when we get so full of those feelings, Sometimes we think, like I've heard many people say this, oh, my horse just isn't ready. My horse is so tense. And I'll look at the horse and the horse is completely relaxed. But the person is putting that on them. And I, I've done it. So it's, it's easy to get it wrapped. You wrap the whole situation up in what you're feeling. So being able to step back and really observe standing on that mounting block, I should have had a time ticker of how much time I spent on that thing, but standing on that mounting block and just breathing and, and waiting until I knew I was present and I was observing him and I was no longer thinking of the what ifs. And I, and that helped me a lot because I'd watch him and he was, he was giving me a flashing green light go. Yeah. So the, and the other thing too, if, I mean, many of you probably are aware of a mindfulness meditation. 
that's been huge for me over the years. And it really just has been recently that I've been doing it more regularly. I'll share with you in the follow-up links. There's a really cool program that uh, makes it very doable and they're short little meditations and it can make a huge because it's training your brain. It's not, it's not like woo woo stuff. Not that woo woo stuff is not good, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, I mean, it's I, very I, scientific. Really. Yeah. You're training your brain to be in the moment. You're training your brain to be present and to, to know that as you're, when you're present, you're going to have those thoughts pop up like, Oh, what if, and pretty soon you can get to where those thoughts just float across. There it is. There it goes. And you're, you're still in the moment. Do you use affirmation? Will you decide that you're going to say something over and over and over again or every day or something where? Right. I didn't, but that, I know that a lot of people um, have had that be really positive. For me, it was the visualization that was, was that affirmation that was, was, you know, me taking the time to visualize that dream and visualize things going awry and me handling it was key. And by the way, with that, there was a time when I, I didn't have the good ending of the story. So that was part of the knowledge. I had to seek that out. I had to find out what do I need to do differently? And if, if he rears, what do I need to do? I needed that piece. To that end, you yeah. need that piece. Uh -huh. And maybe I'm missing it, but the piece was the visualization and the mindfulness. Is that what you're saying? No, the piece was the actual technique that if, if he, if he rears again, what do I need to do besides get into my power position, <laughs> which was by the way, one little, I always end up telling this story. Um, oftentimes, you know, we learn that power position in level one, the, the push on our, on our, on our horn and, and bend. And then we go, ah, I don't need it anymore. I've practiced it. You need to practice that until it is second nature because that saved me. When he reared up, I, I almost, I, I got a huge bruise on my thumb because I, I didn't even think about it. I went there. So I was very thankful that I had put the time in practicing that. That's what, that's what I um, ended up doing um, for myself. And I would say, keep searching out, keep talking to people, keep, because there are going to be other other techniques that I maybe didn't share that might be the perfect thing that'll help you. It's, it's possible. Pleasure of attending my first Savvy conference in 2000. Cezanne was there. She would know because Cezanne was actually participating in, in what was going on. I hadn't met Pat yet. I was in, in the audience, but he was having Casper. It was Casper. Casper. Uh -huh. And he was having Casper do jumps and suddenly Casper was supposed to be jumping over a plastic it was the picnic table mm -hmm. but he missed and he landed smack into the table and just stopped and Pat here's Pat in front of 400 of his closest friends that he invited around from the world and and I could just you know we were all in this moment of oh god and of course the first thing you think of is did the horse die mm -hmm he'd almost busted this picnic table. So Pat did something. I wasn't savvy enough at the time because I hadn't, I was just beginning, I think I showed up with my red string or something and I, it was so clean. My red string didn't even have any glue mm -hmm. on it. I didn't quite know what was happening, but I was amazed that the horse didn't get upset and the horse mm -hmm. waited and there was a group of people, including Pat, and they were all very calm and, it was an amazing amount of savvy. And I found out later as I got to know these people, these were like Andy Booth and some of the amazing people that mm -hmm. uh, Cezanne, those kind of, kind of level of savvy. Mm -hmm. But what I did, Molly, was there was a break shortly after because Pat just went, eh, I better take a break. And, you know, he shut it down and, and we all went off for 10 minutes. But I made a beeline over to Pat at lunch and I said, would you please do me the favor of answering this question, I said, Pat, would you tell us what went through your mind and what was your approach to that moment, which must have been incredibly stressful for even you, Pat, who doesn't mm -hmm. even show the signs of the least bit of lack of confidence. And Pat said, oh, thank you. And he, he did that. So we went back into the arena. Everybody's the, we're sitting, that was back in the days when we were only sitting on, we were sitting on the hay bales, right. out in the middle of of no of there and it was just all kind of 
patched together and we were, it was wonderful. But Pat stood up and he said, the first thing I did was I started to whistle. And I thought about it and go, yeah, he did. He was whistling. That was the first thing. And to most people, that's kind of counterintuitive. And like, oh, really? Your horse just about killed itself. And you just in front of, you know, in this pressure situation, you're whistling. And Pat explained to us that what it was, was he had to get his mind off of it by doing something else. Mm -hmm. Right. And kind of, and Pat says this term, he says, when other people do something, I do the opposite. Right. And I will never forget it because he said, first of all, I whistled and then I stopped and I thought about what I would do. I knew that I shouldn't run to the horse because that would create, uh, that would create a worse situation. But anyway, that was my very first moment when Pirelli got across to me that um, when something bad happens, you almost have to do the opposite Mm -hmm. of what it is that you would normally do. Right. And so one of the things, Molly, that translated into was at the time I was still playing around with Team Penning on my young horse. Mm -hmm. And my young horse had this tendency to buck for joy. Fortunately, Mm -hmm. it was a rocking horse straight up and down buck. But what I did was I started to say, when he bucks, I will just go calm. Mm -hmm. I will do the opposite. I will do what Pat said. I'm going to do the opposite. And I would suddenly just go calm as opposed to locking up, which was just our natural thing. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I could sit the buck, Mm -hmm. right? And I was a relatively, you know, I was, like I said, fresh red, green, red, green, Mm -hmm. green, right? But I think this philosophy that Pat has taught us and obviously has made a huge difference in you. You you picked up what we learned from, yeah, Stephanie Burns, of course, Mm -hmm. was that, you know, sometimes doing the opposite of what you, what you naturally would do is the right answer. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, I do love the fact that you mentioned technique because you said, you know, we, if we remember the techniques of what we should do to shut a horse down when we need mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's important. Uh, what I love tonight is that you've given us a process and some steps that we could use in the situation. All of us have it. Like, I'm pretty confident most people at least call me wild man and, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I do kind of push the envelope. Well, my envelope now is riding bareback and bridalists anytime mm-hmm. and, and it, more than the walk. And so now I have to do, you know, not, I have to do my visualizations and I have to do it because you know what, we're all trying to grow. So mm-hmm. even if we're, even if we're fighting confidence at something negative happened, what about confidence where we want to do, more and we want to do better right well we and the same techniques is right what exactly out. right so with that example like you're wanting to ride bareback and bridalists you look at well what am i comfortable with with that at this point and it might be that i'm comfortable as long as i still have the reins you know in my hand and the neck string then do that a lot and then drop the reins for just a little bit and then bring them back until you're relaxed or trot just a little bit and then bring it back and walk until you're calm again. And then, so it's, it's the same thing that we do with our horse, the approach and retreat. Yeah. There's one other thing I want to tell you, which is another great story around confidence was that I went to a savvy conference a few years later, and I think it was just around the time that you were starting in Pirelli. Um, They decided to do something called a fear makeover. Mm Mm-hmm. And the fear makeover was going to be in, in one of the smaller venues because they, they were breaking up this, the conferences were getting to be like over a thousand people were showing up. You know, remember I told you 400 and now they're all, now we're right. a few years later, they're like a thousand, 1,500, 1.3,000. Mm-hmm. They had to cut it back. Mm-hmm. That many people wanted to be there. Well, anyway, they decided to do the fear makeover and it was Linda was going to teach us all about addressing fear. Mm-hmm. So they had picked a small, one of the venues on the ranch that was so full that there was no room. And Linda looked at all of us and said, well, we're going to change the venue tomorrow. And we were in the largest because so many people are feeling fear for one reason or another. And Absolutely. And seeking that. And, and, and I have to tell you, I'm so excited that you, that you took my offer to come tonight because this art of confidence is a big deal. 
and really even about yeah. us that are more co confident and like kind of like the adrenaline, mm -hmm. there's still that moment when I go, oh, no, no, I'm in that way out there now. And Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, talking to as many people as you can um, and getting their stories, you know, and people that you would never think um, have dealt with confidence issues. You know, Amy Bowers has talked about some of the things that she's had to do to be confident enough to go to the next level of jumping four foot fences. She's had to, she's had to do a lot of these things. So each, each person that you're able to talk to are going to give you maybe some little golden nuggets that you can, you know, bring in. So I think, you know, for those of us, those of you um, that are watching, if you're experiencing where you're, you are rebuilding your confidence or building it, talk to, talk to people, ask them, ask them what they've done. Cause I think you'd be surprised. Most people that have been around horses for a while have, have had to deal with it. I think part of the thing that, 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 that big moment of the fear makeover uh, drawing the largest crowd was all of a sudden mm -hmm. we, uh, we didn't feel alone anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we felt like there was permission to be right in that moment where you, f where you have to recover. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, to be honest with you, Molly, uh, your story really resonates because if it's your profession and it's your lively, I mean, you've suddenly you've reorganized your life around it and then all yeah. of a sudden you have fear like, Holy that's that's a really big deal. I mean, most of us are here recreationally. Yeah. But you had to go through it professionally. And, yep. <laughs> and I just love the fact that you've taken your lemons and created a lemonade because obviously now you're a really strong speaker on the subject. Brett commented that he recognized a lot of names here and he said, nice to see you all, but it's past his bedtime. Almost. Yeah. That's my husband. <laughs> oh, Brett. Oh, that is yeah. Brett. My husband's leaving early. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's he's still the IT guru guy. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was, was it both of the Michelles? Because I noticed there's a 2L Michelle and a 1L yep. Michelle. Yep. There's a west, west, side, west side of the state Michelle and an east side of the state Michelle. Well, what I wonder, ladies, because you were kind enough before we started the show here to say something. Well, okay. Well, yeah, I was one of those um, green on green, black and blue. You know, like Pat always says, <laughs> with my first horse in my 40s and landed in the hospital and broken bones in my back. And it took me a long time to recover. A long time. I'm doing pretty good now, but now I got another horse and I'm not really familiar with him. And he's a little bigger, a little stronger, a little quicker. I'm, I'm a little nervous about riding him. I'm taking it small steps at a time, and like you were saying before, knowledge. <laughs> knowledge is helping me out there. I, you know, I'm I'm not just jumping on. I'm no I'm taking a step at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's that's he's really great. good in, down in Pasco, but since then he's kind of stoving up on me. So okay, yeah, and it's it's challenging too when if you're dealing with confidence issues and your horses as well. Yeah. Um, so I would say one of the things that, that helped me, and I don't know if this will, if this will apply for you, Michelle, but, um, I know that for me, I had to really, when, when Bobby was unconfident, I don't know if you saw him last year at Linda's clinic af after the clinic. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so that was a really good example. Um, I was actually ready to ride him there, but I needed to, in that situation, I needed to be in a place that I could be the best leader for him, you know, staying on the ground. I, I am really confident with him on the ground. And I think you are too. Is that, am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah. He does really well on the ground. What's your, what's your youngster's name? Uh, Ricky. Ricky. That's right. So with Ricky, you know, just really thinking about really staying where you can help him the most and staying, uh, being, you know, the best leader you can be. And then when you are going to ride, really thinking about, okay, what am I the most comfortable with? And I think you're already doing that. I've watched, I've watched you, but, but I, I would just really value that and give yourself permission to, to do that. Yeah, I'm taking it slow. <laughs> good. good. I think you're doing great with him. I mean, like, but like you said, it was, it went well in Pasco and then things maybe aren't going as well as you'd like. Well, I hope maybe some of these things will help. Oh yeah. It, yeah. it brings, it helps me remember things I'm doing. Good. You know, I don't go backwards and make a mistake. 
Right, good, good. I think the, the fact that you've provided a process that we could, you know, pick them and do something positive is absolutely is huge. My story is way too long. The short version is that um, I am a middle-aged poor woman who spent last years developing my savvy. I am very difficult horse, and I switch now to my younger guy, who at first was a dream, who I was standing on. Take a picture of me. I'm standing on my horse, and then within the next month, he showed me some other sides of him, and I've been bucked off. I've had broken ribs. I mean, it's just physic the physical part of it is really hard to get over. So when you, when you look at the, the seven keys, was there one that stood out for you? Okay. Yeah. So of the seven keys, I think, um, time is a big one because my consistency has not been good. Right. My imagination, because I'm my play, I have a hard time having a consistent plan and sticking to a plan. I got the support because I've got Molly. Yay, Molly. But yeah, I don't know. It came kind of came out of nowhere. And I think that a lot of us, like we kind of go along and things are going okay and you're all confident. And then when things aren't okay, you kind of go, okay, wait a minute. It, yeah. And, like you're asking me what of these seven keys, I'm looking back at that now going, okay, what did I miss? And where are these holes that I now need to fill? Right. Cause I think for you, I would, I would guess that there, if you get a few pieces of the knowledge that what's causing him to, you know, this behavior and then what do you need to do about it? I think that's going to be really helpful. And then having the support that Cezanne and I are going to, help you with to be able to see somebody else riding him I mm -hmm. think would be really helpful yeah yeah support yeah. is huge so thank you yeah and then take you know like all the other things that you know you could probably teach this better than me the you know the things of taking care of yourself and not getting hard on yourself mm -hmm. uh easier said than done but that whole self-compassion thing I think would be a really cool thing to play around with yeah, so I've gone back, I've been, been spending a lot of time in the comfort zone. Good. And what I've been playing a lot with, and I know it may not be the greatest idea, but, you know, the truth comes out at liberty. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if I can't get that, then I really have no foundation. So I've really been playing a lot at liberty. And mm -hmm. to be like I not only came off of him, he not only bucked me off, but he ran me over too. And not okay. uh, after that, we've got some other issues to deal with. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, kind of backing into the liberty may not be the greatest idea, but, you know, I'm really working on establishing my boundaries and, and being consistent and putting in the time. Yeah, and I think if you're if you're looking at liberty as um, that your goal is to build the connection, if you're doing things where you're playing games where uh, when he connects with you, that's when you take the pressure off, that's when you invite him in, I would say then that liberty would be a great tool. But as far as teaching him things and helping him with pressure, online is going to be pretty key. I'll be seeing you soon, and I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, no, 100%. I'm all about focusing on the connection with the Liberty, so. Yeah, that's great. Got a comment from Linda Holzenga that mm -hmm. I tend to push past my fear and do it afraid, and then I get into trouble. Yeah. So one thing one thing that I uh, experienced, the, the way that I knew that I'd gone too far was if I got off and I didn't want to ride again. Like when I, when I go into the house and go, I really don't want to ride tomorrow. I knew that I had done that, that I pushed past my fear. Cause you do need to, you, I, in my opinion, if you set a, a guideline or a rule for yourself that I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. Like if I have any butterflies at all, I'm not going to do it. 
I don't know if, I don't know how much progress you're going to make. Like you're going to have a little butterflies when you go to, you know, take that next step. But if you push past, like Linda, what you're saying, if you push past that where it's not just a little butterflies, it's like your heart's racing, your brain's not working, then yeah, we, we are going to get into trouble because trouble our timing's going to stink because we're overreacting and we're not, we're not thinking and feeling um, the way that we could if we were in a more confident place. I, that was part of how I'd measure if I'd gone too far. And then I had to go back a few steps and spend more time in my comfort zone and do, and not just go back and do it again, but do it at a easier level um, until, until I could, maybe if it was walking until I could trot. That was an amazing thing. You reminded me, Andrew, of Pat's horse fell into that plastic picnic table. Yeah, I was there, there too. That's right. I remember we that met. Was an, that was an amazing memory. But what I wanted to say was I was out there in 2004 for a 10-week course. This is before you had to want to be an instructor to do a 10-week course. Uh -huh. um, and the first day of class, I was channeling a gunsel and I took a bad fall. Now, I had the safest horse. Any of you who know Sonny know I had the safest horse on the ranch. And I created a situation where I came off and hurt myself very badly. And that was the first day of class. <laughs> and I took a huge hit on my confidence. And um, I stayed in the class. I did what I could. I had some real bad scared days. And, and I had a friend there who said when we went out to ride in that big field right by the entrance mm -hmm. uh, that was so big and open, she said, just stick by me. You know, do whatever you want to, but just stick by me. We'll be okay. And when I got home and went back to trail riding out here with my buddies, and I had good friends who said, if you need to get off, no problem. We'll help you get back on when you're ready. And what made the difference was that seventh key, which was support. Yeah. And I've always said, we, we spell it B-A-S-P. Hmm. That's cool. It was really... You know, Michelle, I'm just concerned for you because it sounds like you're doing a lot on your own. And maybe not. Maybe you're doing what you're doing with lots of friends or one or two friends. But if you're not, definitely you and your horse should be working out with buddies who can support you and whose horses can support your horse. Because that's what made the difference. And it was three years later that my friend Joanne Martin said, Dee Dee, you need to stop worrying. You're a really good rider. And I realized that I actually had my confidence back. Yeah. And I mean, it was so bad at one point, I couldn't get on Sunny without crying because I was so scared. Oh, I remember that. You know, and you've got to know, this Going is the back, solidest though. horse around. We put people on this horse who are coming back from bad accidents. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just, I love the things you're saying. And I really appreciate actually that you didn't jump to uh, con add, add confirmation. What is that word, Andrew? Oh, affirmations, yeah. Affirmation, because one of the issues about affirmations is you're telling a lie. What's oh, more, interesting. I hadn't thought about more that. Powerful you is, lie to yourself with affirmations, yeah. What more, what's more powerful is actually tell the truth about what you feel and where you are and what's going on. And then as you did, my dear, make a choice about how you want it to be, about how you want yourself to feel in the situation, and about how you, the partnership you have with your horse. Not about how your horse is, not about how your husband is, not about how other things are, but how you are in that situation. And that is a tremendously powerful thing because it's totally the truth. You know, yeah. there's no lie in that. And that's the one weakness about affirmations is there's a, there's a, dis, there's a distruth in them. Whereas if you tell the truth about what you, how you are and where you are, that it's wrong. And then you really make a choice about what you truly want. All of that is truthful and it's tremendously powerful. And with horses, we have to do that a lot. <laughs> oh, well, Dee, I really appreciate that because, you know, I've, I've started to use some affirmations in another place in my life where I'm trying to organize myself, organize myself better. But, but you're right. It, it doesn't make sense if it's a lie and it doesn't make sense if you, if, oh, and going back to uh, Molly's chart, where we kind of came up with the earthquake idea of the foundation. And if the foundation isn't there, you got to build the foundation first before you can even visualize a, a different outcome, right? 
Well, and just to throw in one other thought that I have with the affirmations is I do think it could be a powerful tool if you're using them and you're, you're helping, um, you're using them to help you create a picture. Like if I, if I'm saying I'm, I'm a confident writer that I'm not just saying the words that I'm visualizing that confident writer that I could see that it could be, it could be a really helpful tool. You know, you could say that visualizations are not the truth. They're not the thing in front of you right now, but they're where you want to go. So if you're using affirmations like that, then I could see where it could be really uh, powerful. Well, thank you for that. We had the pleasure of Sandy Parker, who's been a professional for years. She's, She's not in the program now, but she's still tremendous. And I had a moment where I wasn't getting something in the middle of one of her lessons with a whole bunch of Barry Savvy player members around me. And I lost my conference for that moment. And then all of a sudden Sandy walked over and she goes, Andrew, you have a really good seat. You mm-hmm. should get this. Mm-hmm. And, and all of a sudden I went, Oh, that's right. right. I have a really good seat. I can right. get this. And guess what? The rest of the session. And in fact, I have never questioned my seat again. Uh-huh. That's great. And that was like 18 years ago. I've never uh-huh. questioned my seat because in that moment, Sandy Parker told me, I have a really good seat, and I trust right. her. Right. And I think it's just the same way when you said you trust Cezanne. Right. You know, you were able to have, when Cezanne told you something, you go, hey, that's the truth. Right. And I think it goes back to one of the things, the other things that came up to me while I was listening to people on the call, and I know that not everybody has the level of support that we do in very savvy players and being surrounded by um, instructors, you can't, you, you can drive somewhere you're gonna see, you can get to an instructor. But those of you who don't, the video coaching, the group sessions that are now people are offering, and I know um, Molly offers it, um, other instructors are starting to use, you know, teleconferencing, teleconferencing like this, but get that support Because, oh my gosh, how many times those of us who've enjoyed two decades of support and, you know, most of us, I heard some other people on the call, look, my wife and I were plus or minus 40, give or take a couple of years when we got them. Um, Molly, I'm 10 years older than you, literally, Mm -hmm. I'm 58, Mm -hmm. and I got my first horse at 38. Mm -hmm. You know, just having the support is huge and being able to pick up the phone and confidently say, I don't get it. I'm in trouble let somebody, you know, cry on their shoulders and they, and they, because they've been trained to handle confidence issues, Mm -hmm. they're not going to tell you, Oh, what's your problem? They're Mm going to say, Oh, what's a solution. Right. And so rely on maybe not so much the amateurs like me, but the professionals like Molly and, and the people who have gone through the Pirelli program and have, and have all had to deal with, Um, Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about how you, what you provide to your students, Molly, especially distance learning. Sure. So just before I do that, though, um, I I just wanted to, I just wanted to add in um, to what you're saying that even even when you are with a professional, even when you when you are with somebody that you totally trust, like I, you know, with Cezanne, with Pat, Pat's asked me to do things that I didn't think I could do. And that I was really nervous about, but I trusted. I trusted that I was okay with him. Yeah, he um, but there, were ready. but but right. there were also situations where I wasn't, mm-hmm. and I I can only think of one, but that I told him I'm sorry, and I had I had to get off, and it was you know I was humiliated, uh, or I don't know if that's the right word, but well, I was embarrassed. Online though, because now the Pirelli. I mean, I know Linda taught us that it's okay to get off. Well, and so I just, I just want to throw out there that even when you're with somebody you trust, you still need to listen to what's going on for you. I try to create that safety with people that I work with that um, if, if they're saying, if, they're, if their voice is shouting to them that they need to get off, they need to get off. So well, I, I think you need to trust yourself. Well, um, and, and I, think that's, I think it's very valid. It's something that stopped me that Dee Dee mentioned. One of the things that we do in Bay Area Savvy Players, and it was taught to us early on by Sandy, was that we, you know, it's kind of like when you're on a hike, you don't go any faster than the slowest person. Mm -hmm. You don't leave somebody behind and you take the time and meet, you know, me, 
you just have to be supportive of those who are having trouble in the moment. And sometimes right. they get through that moment and then they're back up with you. Or other times, maybe the whole ride's just going to be about getting them through that. Right. Be another time when karma's going to give it back to you by, yeah. by being supportive and reminding us that those of us that have been riding with Bay Area Savvy Players and Pat told us, don't ride with people who don't ride like you and don't mm -hmm. have this whole philosophy mm -hmm. because you're setting yourself up for failure. Right. But on the other hand, if you do and you, and what, and those of you out there that don't know what I'm talking about, ask somebody offline because at some point in Barry Savvy Players, somebody's actually written it down somewhere. We can actually go back and help you see that some of these group things that we do have built into that support at, it literally almost unconsciously now we do these things mm -hmm. when we're together. I will share with you what I do for students to like you asked me about what I do for yeah, I want to hear uh, about the content. Molly Sanders offerings. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll just share real quick. A lot of the folks that are on here are a part of a group and we meet once a month. Um, similar to what you guys have put together. And uh, it's called MAP and it stands for motivation and, and progress. And uh, so the, there are folks that meet in person. And then uh, we also, thanks to my husband, have a virtual component. And each of those uh, meetings, there's a different topic that I am presenting on. And sometimes I'll have a horse. Sometimes somebody else will have a horse. Um, so those are available to folks that are um, not in the area and, um, and that are. And then I'm really excited of, about a program that I started last year that is a 12-week program, and it's called Levels Up. And it's, it's designed, it's all virtual, and it's designed to help people with planning and motivation and knowledge so they can, um, there's a Facebook group um, where everybody can share what's going on. So there's a community that builds. Uh, once a month, I do a live demo with a horse and people can request certain things that they want to see. And, um, and then there's a video coaching element as well. And that's been a ton of fun for me. And um, we've got people from four different countries that are participating. And so I'd love to encourage you to join in on that. And then I'm available for, for lessons and uh, workshops locally. For this year, I'm no longer traveling. So I'm really trying to build everything here that I can do here locally. Can you tell us your website name again? My website is NW, as in Northwest, NW Savvy. So it's nwsavvy.com. Wonderful. There was a couple of comments I do want to, oh yeah, Brett sent it around to everybody. So it's oh, thanks Brett. On that. I thought you went to bed. Yeah, I guess he was just thing. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're still here, uh, Brett. Let's see, the Bamey Ranch, this time it was Dale and he wrote. Hey, you said that right. That's amazing. You know them. That's right. Oh, I do know the Bameys. Yeah, I wrote yeah. them in trail trials. Yeah. That, they were here in the Bay Area before they went up there. But what Dale said that he found that affects his confidence is working with a horse that shows up. If he's in a zone of craziness, I am not galloping out to the pasture yeah. to chase cows, yeah. but back off and maybe work online. Just a thought, work with the horse that shows up that session. Yep, brilliant. I think so too, that was yeah. really good. Catherine Belcher said to everybody, I just started my own horse journey last year. And Molly has really helped me trust myself and to understand my own thoughts and emotions on building the confidence. That's awesome. Kathy's yeah, that's awesome. Great. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. I can't, I, now, now the trouble I have with Kathy is I can't get her to stop cantering. <laughs> oh, she, she, she. She's uh, a cantering fool. She's a cantering fool. Well, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. I want to thank you so much, Molly. This was an absolutely spectacular evening of Savvy. Absolutely. And we had a great time. And I love the fact that you are, so many of your, your local members uh, joined us. Um, yeah. I'm starting to see some thank you to every firm from Nancy Blystone. And thank you from Ruth Easley to both of us. Michelle saying thank you. And I'm so glad that so much of the North, so much of the Northwest was here. And Molly, it's clear, Molly wasn't going to have me emphasize her educational background, but... <laughs> 
the barriers, the barrier, um, we are loaded with people on our horsemanship group that are very well educated and that's part of their lifelong learning and it's really helped them all on their savvy journey. It's clear to me, Molly, now that not only your uh, foundation in education and your foundation in horses have turned you into being really good at you, what you do and we really appreciate you for being here tonight. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the uh, invite and um, I thank you to your whole group for um, welcoming me and it was it was a lot of fun to share some things with you. Well, our best to you and to all the folks up in the Northwest and all of you that are anywhere across the country or are listening to it on tape. May the horse be with you. Awesome. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Let me ride Horses and life Just like the air I breathe This love will be in me Till the day that I die